This video is brought to you by Mubi, a curated streaming service showing exceptional films from around the globe. Get a whole month free at mubi.com slash quality culture. When I first saw the trailer for the 2012 film Life of Pi around 10 years ago, I remember being confused by the premise but intrigued by this unusual rendition of a castaway story. The visual effects alone had me sold, but I was also curious to discover how they were going to pull this off. Like, was the whole movie really about a kid stranded on a lifeboat in the ocean with a Bengal tiger? Well, it turns out the answer is yes and no. Yes, in that most of it is indeed centered on this outlandish scenario and how it plays out, but even while it tackles the matter of physical physical survival, like most castaway stories, it's just as much about spiritual survival. But it approaches the concept in a form I'd never seen before, using a curious mix of zoology and theology to explore matters of the soul. It's based on the 2001 novel of the same name by Jan Martel, a tale the author calls an adventure of the body and spirit. Though one thing I've noticed over the years is that most discussions get hung up on the ambiguous ending. An older pie spends most of the story recounting these fantastical events, but in the end offers an alternative story which is even more horrifying but seems more plausible in the real world. So naturally, there are ongoing debates about which was the real story and why, mainly concluding that the stuff with the animals was made up. In any case, most of the conversation considers the question of what is the truth? But at its core, Life of Pi is ultimately about the power of storytelling, about why so many people take a proverbial leap of faith each and every day. In this video, I want to explain why for the sake of Pi's story, the truth doesn't matter at all. In the first few minutes, we're immediately familiarized with how extravagant stories enrich our lives. You see, my uncle Francis was born with too much water in his lungs. They say the doctor swung Francis around by the ankles to clear the water out. That's what gave him the huge chest and skinny legs that made him such a great swimmer. Pai got his full name, Piscine Molitor Patel, from a French swimming pool visited by a family friend slash honorary uncle, a competitive swimmer who'd raved about the pool's glorious qualities. Mythologizing this foreign swimming pool made Pai's father fall in love with a place he'd never seen before, and in his wonderment named his son after it. I never understood why my father took this so much to heart, but he did. As Piscine grew older and cruel classmates got more creative, Look at him, he, has Piscine. he constructed his own narrative out of social necessity. Usually rounded to three digits as 3.14 pi. The point is, the value of influential storytelling is ingrained in the heart of Life of Pi. Even the author's note at the beginning of the book makes it seem as though what you're about to read is a true interview documented by the writer, blurring the line between fact and fiction. Pi's imagination and curiosity are the main components of his character, and are what led him to practicing three religions. I know religion is a controversial topic. But Life of Pi is less about institutional religion, which definitely comes with its problems, and more about religion as a personal, spiritual practice. There's a certain lack of cynicism about Pi's approach to faith. He became enamored with the stories each religion offered. He was first introduced to faith, and vegetarianism, through Hinduism, with colorful tales about its thousands of gods. The gods were my superheroes growing up. Vishnu, the supreme soul the source of all things. When he came across Catholicism, on the other hand, he was at first confused by the apparent weakness of Christianity's God, but soon came to value the underlying message in Christ's story. We can't understand God in all his perfection, but we can understand God's Son and his suffering as we would a brother's. And finally, Pai discovered Islam, appreciating the deeply devotional and meditative qualities of its prayer. In performing Salah, the ground I touched became holy ground and I found a feeling of serenity and brotherhood. For Pi and plenty of other people, faith is rooted in love. For others, the self, the universe, and existence, it's used as a means to connect with their communities and families and their individual place in the world, how they express gratitude for the joys of life and cope with the pain of adversity. As the book describes, the individual soul touches upon the world soul like a well reaches for the water table, that which sustains the universe beyond thought and language, and that which is at the core of us and struggles for expression is the same thing, the finite within the infinite the infinite within the finite. I'm not particularly religious, but I think if you've ever heard the echoes of a choir in a cathedral, 
the melodic prayers of an imam, or seen the vibrant colors and dances in a holy festival. It's easy to be moved by the gravity and vitality of the human spirit and how we come together for celebrations of life. Again, not trying to downplay or dismiss the negatives, but for most regular people minding their business and living with love in their hearts, that's not all religion is or has to be. In research for the book, Jan Martel was initially trying to understand why people in the modern world would still choose to believe in gods and hold on to faith despite no tangible evidence. Now, like his protagonist Pi, he considers himself non-denominational and respects each belief. That's not to say he doesn't criticize organized religion where it's due, but he defends the positive manifestations of religion, of faith as an act of love. And perhaps above all, Martel remarks on religion's storytelling power. There is a theological dimension to storytelling. All religions tell stories. And why is that? You know, why isn't all religion just Ten Commandments? Well, I think it is because stories involve imagination. And how we take reality involves imagination. And what I like about religion is the same thing what I like about art. Art transforms your existence. It changes who you are. You look at reality differently. Religion does the same thing. You read about Krishna, you try to emulate him. You try to be like Krishna. So you're seeing life through the lens of Krishna. And that changes, it really does change your reality. You are a different person th for doing that. But of course, Pai ran into some external problems juggling this trio of faiths. His secular father thought he was a bit of a weirdo. You only need to convert to three more religions, Pisin, and you will spend your life on holiday. And Pai's community wasn't thrilled either. The book notes, My religious doings were reported to my parents in the hushed, urgent tones of treason revealed, as if this small-mindedness did God any good. Later, upon discovering what Pai was doing, his three religious mentors got into an argument amongst themselves about the faults of each other's religions. Pai told everyone that, like Gandhi, he felt all religions are true, that they all had something to offer. Faith is a house with many rooms, but no room for doubt. Oh, plenty, on every floor. Doubt is useful. It keeps faith a living thing. After all, you cannot know the strength of your faith until it's been tested. That leads us to the lifeboat in the Pacific. Jan Martel said in a PBS interview, The idea of a religious boy in a lifeboat with a wild animal struck me as a perfect metaphor for the human condition. Humans aspire to really high things, like religion, justice, democracy. At the same time, we're rooted in our human animal condition. And so all of those brought together in a lifeboat struck me as being the perfect metaphor. Pai's family owned and operated a zoo in Pondicherry, India, lending to the central ideas of zoology mixed with theology, how hard scientific facts can coexist with religious faith and principles. Pai's father tried to maintain a sense of scientific reason in his family, going as far as making his sons watch the tiger kill a goat to prove that wild animals aren't our friends. And he's right, of course. When you look into his eyes, you are seeing your own emotions reflected back at you. As Pai's family was moving to Canada and transporting some zoo animals along the way, a shipwreck left him lost at sea with a hyena, orangutan, and zebra. Obviously, it didn't take long for chaos to ensue and the hyena killed both the zebra and orangutan, before meeting his end when the Bengal tiger Richard Parker finally revealed himself. In the story, the tiger's name came about from a clerical error. When Thirsty got too big, the hunter sold him to our zoo, but the names got switched on the paperwork. In real life, Martel used the name Richard Parker because it had a strange recurring appearance in instances of nautical cannibalism, first in a fictional novel by Edgar Allan Poe, then in two very real cases where the crew ate the cabin boy after shipwreck. Note to self, never be a cabin boy. Anyway, the tiger's name was a little foreshadowing to the cannibalism brought up later on in Life of Pi. There were other hints of Pi's fate peppered in both the film and book, mentions of other stories and authors that inspired Pi's struggle for survival. The Mysterious Island, The Stranger, Notes from Underground, Max and the Cats, Treasure Island, Robinson Crusoe. Pi's seven-month voyage on this lifeboat, trying to care for himself and a 450-pound tiger, unsurprisingly offered up some time for introspection. In some ways, his journey appeared like a pilgrimage to attain an even stronger level of faith. To quote the novel, I practiced religious rituals that I adapted to the circumstances. They brought me comfort, that is certain. But it was hard. Faith in God is an opening up, a letting go, a deep trust, a free act of love. But sometimes it was so hard to love. Despair was a heavy blackness that let no light in or out. It was a hell beyond expression. I thank God it always passed. The blackness would stir and eventually go away, and God would remain, a shining point of light in my heart. I would go on loving. Eventually, he and Richard arrived, 
no, I can't just call him Richard, that doesn't feel quite right. Eventually, he and Richard Parker arrived at perhaps the most far-fetched chapter of their story, a massive network of algae inhabited by thousands of meerkats, where the ground and pools of water became acidic at night, effectively making it a floating carnivorous island. By the way, I'd love to hear your thoughts on what this island is supposed to represent, because there's a lot of theories out there and I haven't latched onto any particular one. This one is particularly morbid, but a lot of people believe it. Anyway, after Pi found a human tooth and decided he didn't want the same fate, he set off again with Richard Parker. I saw how my life would end if I stayed on that island, alone and forgotten. I had to get back to the world or die trying. Based on appearances, it seems it took quite a while before they finally came ashore in Mexico, where Richard Parker left unceremoniously and Pi was rescued at last. So why didn't he just leave the tiger behind on Meerkat Island? Well, at that point, Richard Parker had become essential for Pi's will to live. And it also makes a little more sense when we consider the idea the tiger was never there to begin with. I was alone in a lifeboat, drifting across the Pacific Ocean, and I survived. Like I mentioned in the intro, this wasn't the only version of Pi's journey. After he was found and recounted the original story for Japanese investigators, they claimed it was too unbelievable. So Pi gave them a story that was a bit easier to believe. One where the hyena was the cook who had treated them cruelly on the ship. Where the zebra was the kind sailor and the orangutan was Pi's own mother. In this version, the cook killed and cannibalized the sailor, and later killed Pi's mother out of anger. And Pi was the tiger. He killed and ate the cook in an act of revenge as well as an act of survival. He was such an evil man, but worse still, he, he brought the evil out in me. And I have to live with that. Richard Parker can be viewed as Pi's coping mechanism after profound trauma. He represents two metaphors at once, an embodiment of godliness, that is, a being beyond our human understanding, creating a narrative where the animal becomes divine and zoology and theology become intertwined. At the same time, he represents Pi's survival instincts, or animal condition as Martel described it. It's no wonder Richard Parker emerged on the lifeboat when Pi finally took a stand against the hyena. And just when Pi no longer required this instinct to live, Richard Parker disappeared into the Mexican jungle never to be seen again. I appreciated that even though he may or may not have been real, they never anthropomorphized the tiger and made him best buddies with Pi. The story stayed true to the nature of animals until the end. You know, my father was right. Richard Parker never saw me as his friend. After all we had been through, he didn't even look back. But Pi needed to believe there was something more. Even in the face of immense suffering and his own act of cannibalism, he didn't want to give in to his animal condition. He wanted to keep his faith alive. So he wept and prayed after killing a fish and watching the life leave its body. He wrote a journal until it was lost in a storm. He saved Richard Parker's life after looking into his eyes. He needed Richard Parker to be more than an animal so he could believe he was more than an animal. That his humanity was still intact. But I have to believe there was more in his eyes than my own reflection staring back at me. I know it. I felt it. Even if I can't prove it. And I think not being able to bid farewell to Richard Parker haunted Pi's memories because it painfully mirrored his inability to say goodbye to his family. I suppose in the end the whole of life becomes an act of letting go. But what always hurts the most is not taking a moment to say goodbye. Ultimately, Pi needed this story because it was something to hold on to in the face of immeasurable pain and hopelessness. There are times when reason provides no comfort when comfort is what's needed most. As Pi said in the novel, Had I considered my prospects in the light of reason, I surely would have given up and let go of the oar, hoping that I might drown before being eaten. If I'm being honest, I'd probably let go too if I were in that situation with nothing greater to put my hopes into. With your whole family dead, no rescue in sight, starving and alone, to maintain your will through that, it seems you'd need a purpose beyond mere reason. It makes me think of Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs. By the way, this pyramid framework isn't really supported in contemporary psychology and should be seen as more of a general outline, but it's still worth examining. Beginning with our basic physical needs as the foundation, food, shelter, 
safety, then there's psychological needs, which we often derive from participation in social groups. And at the top are the more complex self-fulfillment needs, where we feel we're living up to our potential as an individual. This is the version most people are familiar with. But later in life, Maslow was tinkering with adding a new apex to the pyramid, self-transcendence, where self-actualization evolves into seeing ourselves as one part of a larger universe, so that our understanding of existence transcends our independent experience. He describes self-transcendence as being about peak experiences, which he defined as feelings of limitless horizons opening up to the vision, the feeling of being simultaneously more powerful and also more helpless than one ever was before the feeling of great ecstasy and wonder and awe, the loss of placing in time and space, with finally, the conviction that something extremely important and valuable had happened, so that the subject is to some extent transformed and strengthened even in his daily life by such experiences. There's a passage in Life of Pi, along with some stunning shots from the film, that are reminiscent of these peak experiences, including the tendency to waver from transcendence. The volume of things was confounding. I was half moved, half terrified. For the first time I noticed, as I would notice repeatedly during my ordeal, between one throw of agony and the next, that my suffering was taking place in a grand setting. I saw my suffering for what it was, finite and insignificant and I was still. My suffering did not fit anywhere, I realized, and I could accept this. It was alright. It was daylight that brought my protest. No, my suffering does matter. I want to live. I can't help but mix my life with that of the universe. Life is a peephole, a single tiny entry onto a vastness. How can I not dwell on this brief, cramped view I have of things? This peephole is all I've got. This all ties back to Martel's view of believing in a higher power, in a meaning greater than ourselves. Um, so I, I choose to believe that life has transcendental meaning rather than mere uh, chemical, mere horizontal meaning. And to me it just makes it a richer experience. Is it true? Is it factually true? Well, I don't know, but no one who has any kind of faith knows for certain. When you have faith in anything, it's just a disposition to be open and to trust and to move forward that way. And it also, it's a, it's a, it's a way that makes suffering more bearable. If you believe that somehow in a way you don't fully understand, that doesn't make logical sense, somehow things make sense, then suffering is a small part of the canvas of a bigger picture that you don't see. It doesn't diminish the suffering but it does put it in a context. So Pi rejected brutal realism in favor of the better story. But the point is we have a choice. There's an equivalent lack of hard evidence for both. All we have is Pi's testimony. So for Pi, it's not about what we believe, it's about what we'd rather believe. In the same way people get caught up in the question of which religion is the ultimate truth, his interviewers got caught up in questioning which version of Pi's story is true, although it made no difference to the end result. And we are no closer to understanding why the ship sunk. Because I don't know. The version with Richard Parker is how Pi chose to interpret the story of his own suffering. By his own admission, he would have died if not for the sense of purpose Richard Parker gave him. It didn't make a tangible difference what really happened, so the truth was irrelevant. In both stories, the ship sinks, my family dies, and I suffer. So which story do you prefer? And so for Martel, Pi choosing to believe in the better story is parallel to religious faith. Why not believe that? someone transcendentally loves you. Uh, why not believe that? And so why not live that way, to entertain that notion that the operating principle of the universe is love? Why not believe that? In the meantime, still be reasonable, you know, uh, still use reason to improve your life. But once reason fails you, why not believe in this great plan, you know, this great cosmic plan where ultimate realization is this massive act of love? Why not? I think it's pretty useless to apply the concept of truth to matters of spirituality. As Martel mentioned, we all interpret reality differently. As long as it doesn't cause harm, what difference does it make to anyone else what stories bring us comfort? I know some people might say that's the same thing as lying to yourself, but that's not really what I mean. Pi knows which story is more believable and why. He's not delusional or irrational, but he personally prefers the story that gives him more space to cope with heartache, to go on living with love in his heart. Even the Japanese investigators ultimately decided they'd rather believe the story with the Bengal tiger. Thank you. And so it goes with God. 
So one thing I didn't get to talk about much in this video is the beautiful depictions of India in the first act of the movie. And just to branch off of that, I think more people should be giving Indian cinema some love. If you want to delve more into artistic, international films, our sponsor Mubi is a great place to explore hundreds of titles. Mubi is a curated streaming service, a place to watch beautiful, interesting, incredible cinema. Every day, Mubi premieres a new film. From iconic directors to emerging auteurs, there is always something new to discover. With Mubi, each and every film is hand-selected. It's like your own personal film festival, streaming anytime, anywhere. I recently watched Satyajit Rai's The Stranger. Rai was a legendary Bengali filmmaker, and this was the last film he directed. It's about a family who's unexpectedly visited by a man who claims to be the woman's long-lost uncle she hasn't seen in decades. The family is obviously suspicious and don't really know how to handle the situation. The tension was really palpable and it even got me feeling wary and mistrustful. Another thing I really enjoyed about it is that, like Life of Pi, it's a lot about storytelling and what we choose to believe. Of course, the supposed uncle could potentially be peddling a false story, but he also spends a lot of time telling the family stories about his travels and experiences and worldviews that are really different from the way they choose to live. Some scenes remind me of a stage play in the best way, where there's plenty of time dedicated to thought-provoking dialogue about topics like philosophy, religion, and politics. This isn't the only Rai film on Mubi, so I'm looking forward to exploring his other works, along with plenty of other Indian cinema and international films. And if you'd like to do the same, you can try Mubi free for 30 days at mubi.com slash quality culture. That's M-U-B-I dot com slash quality culture for a whole month of great cinema for free. Thanks for watching and I'll see y'all next time. Bye.